Malcolm X once said, there's no better than adversity. Every defeat, every heartbreak, every loss contains its own seed, its own lesson on how to improve your performance the next time. In our everyday life, we face a lot of situations regarding adversity. Some of these constantly impel dread. The vulnerability of its span, the lack of understanding that we have, and its flighty nature can be scary. Yet, every problem has its own solution, and this solution lies in its very own cause, which allows us to identify our mistakes and improve upon them in the near future. So on this positive note, I welcome you all to TEDx Youth at DPSMIS 2020. This year's theme is addressing adversity. As the event approaches its sixth year in the making, we continue to stand as the longest youth event in Qatar. Without any further ado, let us now call upon our first speaker of the evening, who is an American industrial engineer. As the lead of Doha Environmental Action Project, his main mission is to raise public attention to ecological harm that is caused due to plastic contamination and littering and to bring back the natural magnificence of Qatar. What began as an occasional activity in his free time quickly heightened and it wasn't long before this, uh, long before that this champion of the environment took over the lead of DEEP. He has been part of 117 cleanups with more than 5,300 volunteers and has helped eliminate an excess of 65,000 kilograms of trash from Qatar's beautiful seashores. He is none other than one of the greatest climate chevaliers, Jose Sosedo. How do you make yourself relevant in your community? How do you give back in a country whose language is not your own, in a place where you don't have a professional network, a personal network, a place where you don't have wasta, influence, network in Arabic. You let your actions speak louder than the words. My name is Jose Saucedo. I'm an American citizen living in Qatar for the last three years. And I'm pleased to be here with you guys today on this wonderful event. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm an operations manager turned environmentalist. I'm an industrial engineer a problem solver, a project manager. I did not study or prepare myself to be doing what I'm doing here today. I never dreamt that I'll be doing what I'm doing in Qatar today, yet I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to do what I do. I always knew I wanted to do something good and give back to my community. And that's a decision that I made shortly after I arrived in Qatar and I saw the opportunities that I had, I said, I'm going to work on plastic pollution. I'm gonna make myself of use and service for my community. In the past three years, I have mobilized over 8,000 volunteers after having the opportunity to lead wonderful organization called the Doha Environmental Actions Project, DEEP. We are a group of volunteers that are leading the fight against plastic pollution and the beach cleanup movement in Qatar. 8,000 volunteers, more than 130 cleanups organized, and we have removed over 80 tons of trash from the beaches, the sand dunes, and the heritage sites of Qatar. I have been very fortunate to interact with people from all sorts of backgrounds, from all over the place here in Qatar. Thousands of school children have participated in our cleanups. I've done many school presentations and I've interacted with volunteers from all over the world. From business leaders, to ambassadors, to excellencies, to the average Jose here. I've had a wonderful opportunity to try to do what I can to make a difference in my community. Let's talk about the problem. Let's talk about plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is a global issue. It's not any different for Qatar. The whole world is trying to figure it out and we wanted to be part of the solution and not part of the pollution. Just to give you some numbers, every year around the world, 
300 million tons of plastic are produced. 300 million. And plastic is not bad. The problem is how we dispose of it. And oh, by the way, by 2050, the plastic production in the world is going to triple by 2050. The real problem is that less than 9% of all the plastic that is produced is recycled. The rest goes to landfill or we litter it all over the world. It is estimated that around the world every year, 8,000 tons, 8 million tons, I'm sorry. It is estimated that every year, 8 million tons of plastic enter the oceans. That's the equivalent of having one dump truck going to the ocean and dumping its cargo every minute. Imagine that every minute this dump truck is just pouring its cargo into the ocean. I've been talking here for four or five minutes now. That's five dump trucks just emptying all that plastic trash in the ocean. I'm sure that you all have seen on social media the photos, the videos of the animals that have been affected by plastic pollution. The whale that had its stomach full of plastic, the turtle, the bird, the dolphin, you name it, that got caught and entangled on a fishing net and that perished somewhere around the world and even here in Qatar. A whale shark, a dugong, a cormorant, you name the animal, they all are at risk due to plastic pollution and ghost gear and ghost nests. And let's not forget microplastics. They pose a great risk to human health that we just yet don't understand. Scientists are trying to, to still understand how is that impact going to impact our life. But we know this for certain. We know that microplastics are entering the food chain. We know that, that uh, crab and shrimp and plankton are eating these microplastics and then they enter the food chain and a bigger fish eats them and a bigger fish eats that bigger fish and so forth until that fish is in your plate, in my plate. Let's not forget that two and a half billion, with a B, two and a half billion people around the world use the ocean as their main source for protein. That's a lot of people. And the problem is we are filling up the ocean with trash and with plastic. Okay, I know this may sound all gloom and doom and very depressing, but it isn't. Some say, why bother? The problem of plastic pollution is so big, there's nothing we can do about it. And yes, the challenge ahead of us is huge. But this is exactly what triggered me to take action and to focus on the things that I have control over. The time to take action is here and now, and we must focus on the things we have control over. So what am I doing? <clears throat> and most importantly, what are you doing? I'm trying to help people realize the incredible amount of power that they have, that you have, to make a difference, to help solve this issue. There are three key things that have helped me overcome adversity and to be successful with my efforts. <clears throat> First, check with yourself. Recognize that this is not about what so-and-so is doing or not doing. This is entirely about you. What are you doing to help fix the problem of plastic pollution? Are you part of the pollution or are you part of the solution? What are you doing yourself? I oftentimes hear people saying, especially when we notice something is wrong or broken or not working, oh, Someone should do something about that, or someone should fix that, or someone should call that person. You are someone. I am someone. 
Let's be that someone who takes care of the issue and tries to fix it. Second, keep it real. Be respectful, be objective, be constructive, but keep it real. Global problems oftentimes give us this sense, this impression that such things are happening in other places. Oh, not here, not in Qatar. Oh, we don't have plastic pollution. Oh, that's someone else's trash. Oh, that animal or those hundreds of turtles that died because they got caught in a net. Oh, that happened somewhere else, not here in Qatar. Why should I care? Well, I started, during my efforts, during my presentations, when I was talking to people, I started using photos that we capture here in Qatar. Some of them, you, you've been already been seeing them behind me. And that was just an effort to try to keep it real because yes, it is happening here. Yes, we do have plastic pollution. And yes, we do have incredible wildlife in the ocean and inland that is being affected by plastic pollution. People were shocked to see the amount of plastic that we can find in our beaches, in the sand dunes, and on the heritage sites of Qatar. They were also surprised to see the impact that we can have in those weekly cleanups we perform. After an hour of cleaning up, you can see two, 300 meters of beach that have been cleaned, not one piece of plastic on it. Imagine if we all did that. Most importantly though, imagine if we didn't litter to begin with. Yet, we have shown people that united as a group, as active members of society, we can make a great impact on the appearance of our beach, of our environment, and of our country. Seeing that inspires people to do something about it. And when you mobilize thousands of volunteers to a beach cleanup, to pick someone else's trash, you realize that you're going after something good. You're doing something right. So keep it real. Third, make sure others notice your efforts. Regardless of how noble they are, chances are you will be inspiring others to take action. I know that's the case for me, but I alone will not be able to fix the problem of plastic pollution. I need all of you to give us a hand and we know and we need those who are in positions of power, leaders, government officials, business people, individuals. We need all of you guys to do your part so we can do what we need to do to keep Qatar clean for generations to come. So you have to work harder than anyone. How do you get noticed? Work harder than anyone. I will tell you to an extent, go crazy. Do what nobody has ever done. And in my case, that was, I'm gonna do as many cleanups as I can. I'm gonna do as many school presentations as I can. I'm gonna bring as many students, volunteers, business people, companies, whoever that wants to join me on this fight, I'm gonna bring them to the beaches. I did dozens of school presentations in a pre-COVID world. On, on this time of year, every week of the year, I'll probably be spending three to five days either in a school doing a presentation like today or taking the students from that school on a, clean, on a cleanup somewhere on the beaches and the sand dunes of Qatar. There were some times where I, where I would have three, four, sometimes five cleanups on a given week. Yeah, you hear that right? That's almost a cleanup every day. I didn't do that all the time, but it did happen often. So you can say I went crazy until finally people started noticing, acknowledging there's a problem, and more importantly, jumping on the bandwagon so they can help us fix the problem of plastic pollution. People realize that we are part of the solution. 
So in summary, three things. Check with yourself. What are you doing? Are you doing anything or not? Are you part of the pollution or part of the solution? Number two, keep it real. Make sure people can relate to your message within the local context. And number three, go crazy. You have to find a way to catch people's attention. Earlier, you heard me say that there are three things that help me overcome adversity and be successful. And that could be a misleading statement. By successful, I mean being able to, <clears throat> to sit on the table, having people waiting to hear your message, being interested to hear what you're saying, and paying attention to the problem at hand. Yes, in that regard, you can say, I have been successful, that we have been successful because all of my work is possible thanks to all of the wonderful volunteers that support our efforts. But make no mistakes, true success will come the day we no longer are littering Qatar and the world the way we're doing it right now. When we significantly reduce our dependence on single-use plastics, then and only then can we say that we have been successful with our efforts. And when all of us take small actions that will have a huge impact against plastic pollution, then and only then we can say, mission accomplished. We did well. Remember, at the end of the day, this is not about what so-and-so is doing. This is about what you're doing. What are you going to do? Some people need to start on step one, putting trash in the bin. Others will start recycling in school, at work, in their compound, in their apartment building. Others may start using recycling. Uh, others may start using reusable bottles, water bottles, coffee mugs. Some will use reusable bags for the grocery shopping. Others might decide to buy less stuff. Others may choose to use public transportation more often. Some might create an eco committee at work. Some people will create laws that will protect the environment. Others will enforce them. Some will create NGOs nonprofit organizations, whatever you do, it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but you have to do something about it. Make no mistake what scientists are predicting by 2050, if we do not take action, there will be more fish in the water. There will be more plastic in the water than fish in the ocean. That's by 2050. By the time you guys are my age, you may be facing that problem unless we take action. So what are you going to do? If you're a businessman, if you're having a meeting, even in school, don't use single-use water bottles. Bring an alternative. Give people an option. Instead of giving single-use water bottles to everyone, can we have a water station? Can I just refill my bottle there? Those are very simple things we all can do, and believe me, they have an impact. Oh, it's just one bottle, water bottle, said eight billion people in the planet, right? So anyways, we have to start designing and living our life in a way that it reduces, not increases our dependency on single-use plastics. These are just some ideas, guys. Pick one, pick one thing. It can be simple, it can be complicated, but just go crazy and do it. Help us make a difference. I've reached the end of my presentation today. So if you will only remember one thing and one thing only, 
please make sure that it's this. Whatever you decide to do, we must start today. The time for action is here and now, today, for you and I to keep Qatar and the world clean. Let's do what we can and let's keep Qatar clean. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Jose, for your idiosyncratic words about your journey to becoming an active member of the community and inspiring us to take action and contribute towards a positive, towards a positive change. Our next speaker is a connoisseur of the art of expressing ideas. As a communication specialist and an aspiring public speaker, he has several accolades to his name, being the champion of Qatar Talks in inspirational category and a member of the Philcom International Toastmasters Club since 2018. His skill is undeniable. He's a book lover, an avid traveler, and a former dancer with an eternal affinity for the art of ballet. His love for loving the process, the path to success, no matter what the obstacles, is what he wishes to share with the youth. So join us with CJ Rojas and be a part of his magical journey, Love the Process. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's safe and healthy during this difficult time of the pandemic. How I wish I could see your faces, but at least you can see mine. I'm ecstatic and excited to be here today. I am CJ Rojas, and today I will share to you the story of the dream weavers and the lesson that I have learned from them that changed my life forever. Weaving a dream is a figurative phrase, which means to create something. But for the Tiboli women of the highlands of the province of South Cotabato in the Philippines, weaving a dream means everything. Friends, I came from a place in the Philippines where a certain tribe claims that the inimitable patterns that they weave came from their dreams. Then they make it into a fabric called Tinalak. I am talking about the Tiboli women of the province of South Cotabato, commonly known as the Dream Weavers. It was six years ago when I had the opportunity to meet and have a conversation with them up close for my college thesis. Along with my group mates, we hiked the highlands to gather relevant data. The focus of our study is to capture quantitative information as to how much these Dream Weavers earn. Thus, the title of our thesis is The Profitability of Tinalak. During the course of our study, we observed that weaving tinalak is nothing but a tedious process, which involves numerous steps for a single cloth to be completed. Making tinalak, in simple term, is a lot of work. But despite the labor-intensive process in weaving, the cloth's richness in cultural value, the intricate and authentic craftsmanship involved, the Tinala cloth costs almost nothing. The first thought that came to my mind is why? Why would these Tiboli women do something laborious without getting well compensated? I mean, what's in it for them? Would you do something laborious without getting well compensated? I wouldn't. Confused at the time, I can't help but ask why. Subi, one of our respondents and one of the dream weavers said that the Nalak represents the achievement of their dreams and no amount of money can remunerate their feeling of joy when weaving. She also added, that their greater happiness lies in enjoying the process of weaving. At that time, I said to myself, what is she talking about? Weaving? Enjoying the process? It just doesn't make sense. You see, people can only be happy if they achieve their dream. Don't you think I'm correct? Talking about dreams, let me tell you something about mine. Ever since I was a little boy, I've always dreamt to travel the world. At a very young age, I was very inquisitive. I always asked myself the question, how? 
How could I be able to do that? How could I be able to realize my dream? At that time, I have two options. It's either I'm going to be a pilot or a cabin crew. However, the first option seems not an option at all, since my parents couldn't afford it. So I set my eyes in option number two, and that is being a cabin crew. While I was in the university, I made sure that I improved myself so I could be able to fit in the job. Communication skills, check. Appearance, double check. Height, 50-50, but my confidence was 150. After finishing my studies, I got a permanent job in a government agency in the Philippines. They say that as long as you don't commit anything illegal, you can keep the job until you die. Others find it reassuring. I, on the other hand, find it terrifying. What terrified me the most is not being able to give my dream a shot before it's too late. The urge to explore and defy limits has always been inside me, and I felt I couldn't contain it any longer. That's why a year after I resigned from that job, used all of my savings, and booked a one-way ticket to Doha, Qatar. Impulsive, I know, but I was full of hopes that one day I am going to become a cabin crew and ultimately I am going to be happy. I arrived in Doha in year 2016 during the month of Ramadan under a one month validity tourist visa with no one in here but a single friend. Crazy and risky, right? That's why I don't, I don't recommend people to do it. And on top of that, I wasn't informed that most of the people here during Ramadan are busy, feeling hungry, and sleepy. However, I persevered the office timing constraints and the humidity as well, and I was able to submit my applications. And guess what? A week after, CJ got his reply. A regret notice. I said to myself, never mind. One rejection should not stop you from achieving your dream. I became more determined. I sent countless applications and I got countless rejections, one after the other. At that time, my visa was expiring. My money was tight. I got no one in here to support me. Just like the reals in my pocket, I felt the hopes of fulfilling my dream started to vanish. And then just like an answered prayer, I received an email that says, we are hiring for a welfare officer. Are you interested? I thought cabin crews are overrated. Well, I didn't want to go home as a failure, so I accepted the offer. I ended up working and living in El Cor, in a porta cabin. At least, it's a cabin. But feeling isolated from the rest of the world, feeling lost, I dreaded every single day of my life. I asked myself, what now? CJ, this is not what you have dreamt of. I felt. I've lost my dream. When was the last time you felt you've lost yours? At that night, I decided to go out and gaze at the stars, hoping to find some answers, some clarity in my situation. That's when I remembered my way up to the highlands, and I recalled Subi's words, happiness lies in the process. I realized I was so caught up in achieving my dream that I ignored opportunities, limited my happiness to being a cabin crew alone. And most importantly, I missed life's precious moments. How about you? Are you enjoying the process? Since that day, I started to appreciate the new pattern that life has presented me in the Porta Cabin. 
where I discovered my gift in human resources and communications. I got promoted in my job. Actually, I find a better opportunity when it comes to my job. And the most important thing, and the fun thing too, I was able to travel the world. I didn't need to be a cabin crew after all. In life, when you stop the pressure of chasing your dream, your dream starts chasing you. When you enjoy the process, you feel grateful that pulls your dream towards you. Enjoying the process made me notice the smallest things in life that are very important. I was able to value and strengthen my relationships. I was able to connect with a lot of people. And most importantly, I was able to find peace within myself. When you enjoy the process, you grow more that pulls your dream towards you. Enjoying the process have led me to explore some areas in my life that I didn't know I was capable of, such as public speaking. Back in 2018, I joined Philcom International Toastmasters Club, one of the premier Toastmasters Club in Doha, Qatar, which helped me hone my potentials and helped me become the speaker that I am today. When you enjoy the process, you live with more purpose that pulls your dream towards you. Enjoying the process made me realize my why in life. And I have learned that it is not something that you find, but it is something you decide to become. As for my why, it is to be able to inspire people with my stories and ultimately help them become the best version of themselves. Today is a proof how far enjoying the process can take you. I didn't plan this, yet here I am, sharing my story with you. Last year, who would have known that I would win Qatar Talks 2019 and would be able to inspire, connect with people of different nationalities from all over the country? I didn't know I could speak in public and win an award. Once you allow yourself to enjoy the process, you'll never know what you'll become. Friends, what is your dream? What is your tinalak? Now tinalak has already walked the streets of Paris, Milan, and New York, all because the Tiboli women enjoyed the process of weaving. In the tapestry of your life, your weaving may sometimes fall short of strands. Fibers may get tangled or even break loose. Achieving your dream is not a guarantee. The only guarantee is your choice to enjoy the process. Today, we are faced with a new reality where achieving our dream feels like not a guarantee. Perhaps you feel scared, depressed, or discouraged. Don't be. This is not the end of your dreams, but just a part of the process. To all the youth out there, wherever you are in the world, I invite you to continue to aim for your dream. And remember, happiness lies in the process. Enjoy the process and awaken the dream weaver in each one of you. Thank you. It is now time to welcome our next speaker for the evening. Kumam Al Madid is a powerful orator and an author of three English fantasy novels in Afghatari origin. She has worked in a few governmental and semi governmental organizations and is currently the head of the uh, me media and publications of Qatar, at Qatar University. Kumam began composing books in 2007 as just a leisure activity, and then began her writing career with a blog specializing in film criticism. After two years, Kumam zeroed in her scholarly work on her originally distributed novel, The Lost Rose, followed by The Calling Magic. Her talk will share her journey on how she overcame mental health issues. So join us as she writes her journey into spoken words.
Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kumal Mualid, and I am here today to share with you how I wrote my journey. As you know, we are born into this world with nothing but our imagination. We play, we laugh, and we explore. But then we grow up, and we begin to understand the many faces of life. We understand its opportunities, its laughter, its happiness, but also we explore its struggles. For me, that struggle was depression. Depression took a hold of my soul and wouldn't let my heart laugh or feel anything. I grew up in a very comfortable and peaceful life. But the demons here didn't allow me to enjoy it at all. The only thing that kept me going was my stories. The magical worlds that I have created in my mind and the other ones that I have read about in books and have watched uh, in the screens. Stories like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Charmed and Buffy. Stories of love, adventure and powers. Stories that slowly and steadily lit a fire inside of me. A fire that erupted to its full potential when I held my first pen. Writing my stories gave me the courage to face my demons. It helped me visualize all of my fear, doubt, and trauma, and led me to the needed tools to vanquish them. Writing breathed a, a new soul into my heart and gave me the purpose and goal. For once, I was truly happy. That was when I realized that the past years of darkness were not normal. Life is not meant to live like that. It's not, me it's not meant to live numb and submerged in darkness. And so I started reading about mental health alone, especially alone, in a world that shames mental illness. Through my search for answers, I have given my pain a name. It was depression. And from there, I began, I began to heal. I started reading, I started writing, and I sought help. My stories helped my, held my hand through all of that. It gave me the strength to face all of my demons and gave me the courage to seek better resources and better help. I have managed to overcome so much through my stories and I am still not done and life will still challenge me and suffering is inevitable. But so is love and so is happiness and so is peace. And through all of that, my stories will always be with me. When I decided to publish those stories, I had doubts, I still have some, about, writing, uh, about being a writer, about exposing my mind and soul, and have them judged by strangers, to have them say, who are you? Why do, should we read for you? You are not good enough. How dare you dream this big? But the fire inside of me is stronger than the doubt. The urge to bring those stories to life and share them with people drove me to break my own boundaries and set my mind free. In my first novel, The Lost Rose, I talked about depression in a subtle way. I had, uh, the story was about Anya, who was, uh, who was running away from a dark secret, and she represented depression as its darkness. And in her way, she found uh, faith brought her to Luca, who represent the light. And these two, both, uh, these two character, characters represent the two stages that I lived through in, with depression. The darkness and the rock bottom, if you may say, and also the light, the healing, the, uh, the way after the darkness. By writing these two characters, I managed to make sense of my, ment my, my mental struggle and allow me to have an honest dialogue with the, all of these parts of myself inside of me. Then, when I was uh, subjected to mental abuse in one of my previous jobs, 
I was inspired to write my second novel, Calling Magic. Calling Magic is a story about a girl, a powerful witch her name is Tia, who ran away from a job to a next one because she was too powerful, she was too worthy, she was too um, accomplished. So people used her and attacked her. So through her story and through finding this new peaceful place, she managed to find happiness and she managed to accept her strength and her powers. And through her, I realized that I should be proud of my strength and I should be proud about all the accomplishments that I have made. After all of that, something else popped up. You know, the struggles keeps coming and we keep on overcoming them. Um, I had a really severe bad writer's block. I needed inspiration. I needed to, to have a reason to write again. So in order to get through that, I stopped thinking about any kind of um, a pressure about writing. I, I stopped thinking about novels, stopped thinking about everything, and I just start writing for fun, for me. I uh, use different voices, I use different people, different genres, and then I publish them in a collection of flash fiction and short stories and sparks of imagination. And I was blown away by how people reacted to these stories. All in the end, I just thought because I was true to myself. You know, I never imagined that people would love these books, but truth gave me my strength. It gave me my voice, this voice that is evolving with every struggle, with every experience, with every possibility in this life. And even today, it is growing. Um, it's a voice that led me to write and publish stories. And now I am creating worlds. I am creating fantasy worlds and I'm creating stories for other people to cope with their struggles. And it made me feel like life came full circle for me. In our world today, all, with all the pain and suffering everywhere in the world, we need creativity and art more than ever. We need to feed our souls with laughter and hope. We need to also realize that our feelings are valid and that we are not suffering alone. Stories, whether written, filmed, or expressed by any kind of artistic way, allow us to transfer out of our own reality to something more. It makes us live through experiences we would never live other than through a book or through a painting. It made us see people, see their struggles, and also it allowed us to see our own pain visualized and help us get through them. Stories expand our horizon and help us understand ourselves and others. They are pure magic. And behind every story is an artist. Through my journey as a writer, I have met an amazing group of artists locally and abroad. They are singers, they are writers, they are illustrators, and so much more. They are truly creators. Now I was blown away by their talent and their determination to show their stories. Along alongside these artists, I met the shy, aspiring artists who have all amazing stories and amazing talent and the, the art to help them express it. But they are shy and they are afraid of this doubt. They are afraid to show their truth to people and, you know, just in case someone will judge them or be mean to them and then they will go back to their shop. I know that being a creative person, whether established or not, is not easy. I understand the struggle of feeling too much and sensing everything. We as artists sense pain and suffering everywhere. We feel the earth is weeping under um, our feet. And of course, we suffer under the pressure of our own minds, the crushing self-doubt and feeling we're not good enough feeling that we are just frauds trying to pass as artists. I wish I could give you a magical secret that will vanquish all the doubt once and for all, but sadly that doesn't exist. What exists is a mountain of resources and professional people who are trained to help you understand your struggle and get you the tools that help you overcome them. 
Once you face your inner demons and find your true self that was buried under all of that pain, you will soar higher than you ever imagined. There is no shame in asking for help. The shame comes from undermining your own pain. The shame comes from society that gave us expectations that we cannot beat. It is hard <laughs> for us to talk about this thing because it truly is mental illness is still under a lot of shame, which we have to break. And I'm happy to say that things are changing. People are now are open to this dialogue to talk about mental health, to seek help, and to encourage other people to seek help and grow together and heal. I am here to tell you that every dark feeling you are suffering has a name, whether it's depression, anxiety, imposter syndrome, low self-esteem, OCD, and so much more. And I am here from the other side of that suffering to tell you that you can be healed. If you just hold into the beauty of your story and dare to seek help from yourself and from others, because you are enough, you are worthy of dreaming big, and you are worthy of being happy. Stories helped me find the light inside of me that taught me that it's okay to be myself, that I am not alone in my suffering. Stories literally saved my life. And I am not done exploring the art of this story and all the worlds that come with it. I am not done and neither should you. Thank you for your wonderful speech, Ms. Kumar. We are grateful for the time and energy that you have spent into sharing your wise thoughts with us. Our next speaker is a multitude of personalities in one individual. An excellent communicator, problem solver, and negotiator are some of the words that can be used to describe him. With a wide range of work experience focusing on customer service, he has been to 90 countries and interacted with several cultures. Having over eight years of experience in the aviation industry, he has been through the most complicated of times. Please welcome the human pot of knowledge, Ahmed Hikal. Adversity, misfortune, troubles. All these words that we hear every day. And those things happen to us. The important question here is how do we deal with those things? How do you overcome? those things. Let me share with you a story that's happened to me and what I learned from it. 1st of March 2016 7.40 p.m. I was sitting home with my wife and you know in March weather is still okay, right? And I looked at the EC, and then I started discussing with her. Honey, let me try the AC. If it's working, well and good. If it's not working, maybe we need to fix it. My wife had a different opinion that time. She said, honey, if the AC is working, well and good. If it's not working, then we need to buy another one. Well, obviously, I said, yeah, sure, honey. But in my head, I was praying to God that it works. I put the AC on. We started to have dinner. And I told her, it seems like it's working. Five minutes later. Boom! The AC blasted. Two pieces. One piece next to me. One piece next to the curtain. Things start fuming. The fire was almost everywhere. And I didn't know what to do. My brain was frozen. Even though I'm kind of trained to do this, those kind of things or deal with the fire. But I didn't know what to do at that time. The first thing came to my mind. I told my wife to get down. Take the kid. One year old kid. Take the kid down and start evacuating and call 999. And still, I was still frozen. No one is prepared to face such situations. 
and within a matter of seconds, I was looking for fire extinguisher, <laughs> but I didn't have it in my house. I get down directly down. I got one from the car. It was that small. And what I could do is only put that much of fire down. And I was standing looking at my house getting burned. My heart was crying, literally. What I did after that, I started to evacuate. And I started to shouting, evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. I knocked every door and evacuated the whole building. And before I came down, I was just looking at my house, my flat that it just became like a charcoal. I didn't know what to do. And when I went down, I told my wife, did you call the 999? With a matter of seven minutes, they arrived. When they arrived, they managed to put the fire down, <laughs> but nothing was remaining there. Every single thing was burned out. Name it, clothes, money, phone, laptop, fridge, couch, etc., etc., etc. Nothing remained. And then I was supposed to have duty that day. I was supposed to travel to Munich. So I told my wife, pass me your phone because I lost already my phone. I took the phone and I called one of my friends and I told her, do you mind to give me the welfare number? She was like, why? I was like, my house was on fire and I don't think I'll be able to go to duty today. She was like, oh, sure. I called the welfare number, the emergency number, and I told her, mom, I have a situation here, my flat went on fire and I don't think that I can come today for a duty she was like um, um, uh, uh, okay I'll call you back I'll call you back 30 seconds later the manager called me she knew me personally she told me hi Ahmed what has happened I explained the situation and what she told me okay listen I don't know what to do now. It's pretty late. That's almost 8.30 in the evening. Do you think you can find yourself a place to stay in only for today? And we will see what we can do later on. And don't worry about the next five days. We will place you on a leave. I said, okay, that's a bit relieving. And while I was standing, I was thinking, what is my next step? what I will be doing, where I'll be going. Because simply, I cannot just call a friend and tell them, uh, do you mind if I just stay in your house for five days, me, my wife, and my kids? That was kind of impossible. Some of the neighbors that offered me, but, you know, for the sake of offering. Then, within a matter of five minutes, one guy came to approach me. And he's like, hi, Mr. Ahmed. He's like, yeah, how can I help you? Who are you? He said, I'm the husband of your friend, whom you just called now. I was like, sure, tell me. He's like, listen, don't worry about anything. I got your back. You will come with me. You will stay in my house for the next week. And we will think together to be honest I had no other choice but to go with him this story has taught me very important lesson those are the pictures of my house after the fire that I clicked with my wife's phone I can tell you that you cannot figure out 
what was that? Literally, you cannot tell where is the bathroom from the hall or the kitchen. It just all burned out. Everything that night was eaten by the flames. The old me was eaten by the flames. But the new me was born that night. I've learned two important lessons. The first one is the friendship. Let me tell you that one loyal friend is worth more than thousand fake. Think about it. How many friends do you have? Oh, thousands, right? But then, how many are actually loyal friends? If you have a trouble or disaster, whom would you call? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Among thousand, maybe one you would call. Maximum two, which is I doubt. The people are loyal to the need of you. Not to you. Once this need finished, even their reality changes. Ladies and gentlemen, choose your friends very carefully. The word friend, you cannot just call it to anyone. He or she needs to be privileged to have this title, friend. Remember, choose your friends very carefully. The second important lesson that I've learned is the mentorship. You can't push anyone up to the ladder unless he or she is willing to climb himself or herself. Some of you might wonder, what does that have to do with the mentorship? But let me tell you something. The two mentors that I had, and I still have, until this moment that I'm standing here, they were my crunches in this situation that I was facing. The first one, Karim Elitr. This person has taught me too many things, has been to me a very good mentor in a way that the skills that I have learned helped me in standing right here and until this moment. You might think that mentorship is only about certain thing in life, but the skills that I have learned from him actually helped me to go through all these difficult times. I became an entrepreneur because of him. This person has helped me in a way to change the way that I'm thinking. The second person, his name is Muhammad Iraqi. And this person was the kicking start for me to start my journey in Toastmaster. I gained the confidence, the public speaking skills. I gained the skill to think on my feet. When you think about it, those skills that I have learned from those two mentors has helped me in developing myself. And when I got developed, I could say that easily I can pass any problems. And I mean it, any problems, any trouble, any difficult time. In conclusion, those two things are the most important lessons that I have learned from this accident. The friendship and the mentorship. Ladies and gentlemen, choose your friends very carefully and get a mentor right now. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for your wonderful speech, Mr. Hikal. Our last speaker is one of the prominent budding entrepreneurs and groundbreaking speakers of Qatar. Recognized as one of the best 28 speakers on the planet by Toastmasters International, her enthusiasm for expressing wise thoughts needs no further explanation. She's the founder of an educational events company, Speak and Shine, and the host of a weekly online talk show called Toxopedia, which is a stage for speakers from various parts of the world to share their ideas. As a bookaholic and visionary, she has the confidence in fulfilling dreams by pursuing it with energy, perseverance, and excitement. She is none other than Nisha Shivram. So join us to be inspired by her talk, What is Your Story? We are all stories, different, different stories. But the question is, is our story worth reading? Is our story worth sharing? Because stories are extremely powerful and your story will have the power to change lives when you will decide to change the story of your life. So what is your story? Now, if you ask me, my story starts in a small town named Malanchkhan. You might not have heard about this town, but it is in the Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. I grew up as a brilliant, yet very mischievous kid. And I loved going to school. Well, not for studying, but to play pranks on my classmates. And my most favorite prank was the frog prank that happened only during rainy season. When it would be raining heavily, I would set out on my mission to catch the frogs. And let me tell you that there is a technique to catch frogs. It is not easy. You have to sit down and wait for the frog to settle down. At least for five minutes, you have to be there in that position. And once you see that the frog is settled down, not moving, focused on one thing, you have to simply go and catch it. I would do it every time during the rainy season. Put these frogs in a poly bag and take it to the school. I would sit at the back bench and when the class is going on, I would remove these frogs and throw them at my classmates. Now it gave me immense pleasure seeing my classmates jumping yelling, shouting, not knowing what exactly had happened. So my days passed. I passed my final year of my school. And before leaving the school, when I went to meet my teachers, they all had only one thing to say. Nisha, you have been a brilliant student, but you messed it up. You could have done better. But that part of my life story is called the messed up story. The story of my life transformed from the messed up story to the story of a rebel when I went to the college. During my college and hostel days, I did everything except studying. I bunked classes, I got into college strikes, street fights. I have stopped strangers on the road and threatened them for no reason, just for fun. I would sometimes hang myself in the balcony and yell for help just to have some fun time with my friends. Well, I studied but I did not study the way I was supposed to do. And I was happy with the kind of marks that I got, at least I passed. That is what my thought. When I passed college, again, my mother had to say only one thing. Nisha, you messed it up. 
you could have done better. I passed my college, I did post-graduation, and then I moved to a very big city for a job. While all my friends were busy establishing their career, I was busy switching jobs, sometimes within a year, sometimes within six months, just for fun, because I was not serious about my profession or my life. After marriage, I moved to Qatar with my husband, and life went on. In 2010, when my mother was on her deathbed, I went to see her, and in her eyes, I could see those words one more time, that Nisha, you could have done better. Now, I graduated from being an immature young girl to even worse, mother of two wonderful kids. But did I ever try to change the story of my life? No. It was only during this pandemic and when lockdown was announced, I had ample time to reflect on my life and to be very honest, I have always felt proud of those mischiefs, those pranks, and the incredible things that I have done in my life. I used to share it with my friends and relatives with joy and pride, as if I have done something great in life. During lockdown, I stumbled upon a story of a tutor in Kolkata, West Bengal, India. Now, this man has been living in lockdown for the last 40 years. At the age of nine, he was paralyzed and his body below the shoulders became powerless. He had to discontinue his studies. So that means he has no formal education. But he didn't give up. He addressed that adversity and tried to find opportunities in them. He started reading books. He increased his knowledge in all the areas of life. And one day it so happened that he had to take maths tuition classes for his neighbor. They liked it so much that all the kids in his neighborhood started coming to him. And that is how he started conducting tuition classes in that area for free, for free. He's a very well-known tutor and mentor for all the kids in India. And even in this lockdown, he has been conducting online classes for all the students, lying on his bed without moving. As I finished this article, I asked myself, is your story worth reading? Is your story worth sharing? What kind of an impact your story will make on the lives of others? And I got no answer. I thought about it and I decided to rewrite the story of my life. But I had no idea how to do it. That is when I thought of starting an online talk series named Toxopedia. But again, I had no idea what to do in the talk series. And then it came to my mind that why not share stories? Stories of people who have faced challenges, but they, people who have risen like a phoenix in their lives. And that is how, in the month of July, I started the online series Toxopedia, where I invite individuals from different parts of the world to share their stories.
Now, these speakers are not established speakers. They are not professional trainers. They are very ordinary individuals coming from different countries, different cultures, different professions. But they all had one thing in common, their extraordinary stories. And I'm glad that the tutor of Kolkata, Mr. Rajiv Podar, was one of the speakers in Toxopedia. He spoke for 40 minutes, lying on his bed in one position. And in his room, I could see TVs all around in every direction. So the moment he moves and changes his direction, he can look at the TV on that side. Or when he moves here, he can look at the TV on the other side. And that is how he keeps himself entertained. Now I want to ask you all, what is your story? Have you ever thought about it? As I said, stories are extremely powerful. And your story will definitely have the power to change lives only when you decide to change the story of your life. Now, as the youth, you may mess it up. You may rebel against all the traditions or trends. It's your life, your story. But one day, when somebody would read the story of your life, let them not tell you that you could have done better. You messed it up. At any point of our life, we have the power to tell ourselves that this is not how my story is going to end. And at that moment, you need to hold the pen tightly and rewrite the script of your life. Today, Toxopedia has completed 19 sessions with 19 wonderful storytellers. And I have been receiving messages from people saying that they want to listen to more stories from such inspiring people. And I would be glad if I could change one life at a time with one story at a time. I have read it, written the script of my life by making a difference in others' lives. Now, I'm not proud of all those things that I did in the past. Now, the messed up story is still there. The story of the rebel is still there. I cannot change it. And I cannot even share those stories with my kids. How pathetic, because I don't want my kids to do the same thing, take the examples from my life and do the same thing, no. I don't want my kids to read those stories and tell me, mama, you could have done better, you messed it up, no. I want them to look at my story and ask themselves, that just like my mother, is my story worth reading or worth sharing? What is your story? Think about it. And it is very easy to change the script of your story when you ask these questions to yourself that what kind of an impact my story would make when I sh would share it with others. Will I be sharing it with joy and pride? Or will I be ashamed of the things that I have done? And at that moment, when you will not get any answer, that is the moment you have to change the script. So at this lockdown, what is the story are you writing? Have you addressed the ad adversity and found the opportunities to create new stories of your life? Well, if you haven't, it is time that you do it. Because at the end of the day, my dear friends, we are all stories, different, different stories. Make sure 
that your story is worth reading. Make sure that your story is worth sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you for enlightening us with your experiences and being the guiding compass on helping us understand how to overcome our adversities. Now I would like to call upon the stage Shivam and Bilal to propose the vote of thanks. As the longest running youth event in Qatar, TEDx Youth at DPS MIS has constantly motivated the youth around Qatar for the past six years. To be able to call myself the lead organizer of this event is truly the greatest honor. With the current pandemic around us, the need to empower the youth has only increased and a platform like TEDx lays a perfect stage to achieve this. I would like to take this opportunity to thank key members of the school that made this event possible. Firstly, I would like to thank Mr. Yasser Nainar and the whole DPS management for trusting us and giving us the opportunity to host this event every single year for the past six years. Next, I would like to thank our principal ma'am, Ms. Asna Nafis, for guiding us throughout the process and provide us the motivation to hold this event. I would also like to express my gratitude towards our vice principal, Ms. Soma Bhattacharji, for her overall support in helping us communicate effectively to have a successful event. This year has been a true roller coaster for everyone, but this event would not have been possible without the constant efforts and hard works from the past eight months with this amazing team. And with that, I would like to introduce you to the team that made it all possible. Firstly, I would like to call upon our curator, Nakshatra Gayan, who is responsible for finding and contacting speakers and ensuring that the talks are of the highest quality. Next, I would like to call upon our head of marketing, Kapil Pavnikar, who is responsible for all the posts and updates that you see on our social media handles, including competitions and interesting polls as part of our event. Next, I would like to call upon our head of IT, Rudra Rupani, who is responsible for designing the website from scratch and including interactive elements never seen before. Now, I would like to introduce our heads of graphic design, Pradimna Dagupati and Jhalak Bansal, for working on creating our digital artwork and posters that were used in all of our web marketing. Next, I would like to introduce our head of press, Naveen Durairaj, for working on editing and filming the speaker videos that we used in our event. Next, I would like to call upon Lenora Fernandez and Priyanjana Das as her heads of visual design for designing and decorating the stage with props that bring this event into reality. Next, I would like to call upon Trisha Ambrale as our head of finance for managing and maintaining the budgeting of the event as a whole. Now, I would like to introduce our heads of event management and logistics, Liana Salim and Moha Kwaswani for working on effectively organizing and managing our events. And lastly, I would like to introduce our executive producer, Arya Kanade, for keeping the record of all our important documents and meeting minutes. It's been a pleasure serving as the co-lead organizer of this great TEDx event. I would like to thank all the people involved with the production of this event. And to the people watching from home, thank, thank you. you. Addressing adversities is indeed a wonderful topic that has been chosen as a the theme for our DPS MIS TEDx event. This event has become an iconic event for our school students and it's one of the longest running events in the entire region of the Gulf. Our team of TEDx Executive Committee has worked very hard in order to bring out the TEDx Youth at DPS MIS 2020. Keeping in mind the pandemic, every single safety norm has been followed. Children have been alone in their homes but have been collaborating online in order to make it possible. We thank the speakers who have taken time out to come and be a part of this event. We deeply appreciate on behalf of the management and on my own behalf and on behalf of the entire staff, the effort taken in by the Executive Committee of TEDx Youth at DPS MIS 2020 for making this event possible. This event is indeed a proof that we can work in spite of the biggest challenges and live with hope. Thank you.